In this video, we come to the payoff of our efforts. We translated the more general joint functor theorem to the general representability theorem, and then last time we took the statement of the general representability theorem and rephrased it in terms of the existence of an initial object in a category, which we call the initial object theorem. Let's recall what each theorem states and correlate the various terminology in each. For the more general joint functor theorem, if A is an idempotent complete category, then G is an adjoint functor if and only if 1, G is uniformly continuous, and 2, G satisfies the solution set criterion. For the general representability theorem, if A is idempotent complete, then a pre-sheaf T on A is representable if and only if 1, T is pointwise continuous, and 2, T is petty. For the initial object theorem, if E is idempotent complete, then E has an initial object if and only if 1, E is cone complete, and two, E has a pre-initial set of objects. In the more general joint functor theorem, we are trying to determine if G is an adjoint functor. In the general representability theorem, it's if T is representable, and in the initial object theorem, it's if E has an initial object. We have such a generalization by taking a functor G to its presheaves B, B, G for each B object B, and then taking the category of elements of a presheaf. This then shows that the initial object theorem implies a general representability theorem, which implies a more general adjoint functor theorem. And we can continue this chain of implications all the way down to the special adjoint functor theorem. So it is enough to prove the initial object theorem in order to prove them all. Let's rewrite the statement of the initial object theorem properly. Let E be an idempotent complete category. Then E has an initial object if and only if 1, E is cone complete, and 2, E has a pre-initial set of objects. To prove the forward direction, we let 0 be the initial object of E, then E is cone complete since every triangle with vertex 0 commutes by the universal mapping property of the initial object. Moreover, the singleton set containing 0 is a pre-initial set of objects, again by the universal mapping property of the initial object. Conversely, let PJ be a pre-initial set of objects for E, set boldface J to be the discrete category with object set equal to the set J, then let D be a J diagram in E which sends J to PJ. Since E is cone complete, there exists a cone, little pj, from w to big pj on d. Therefore, w is a weak initial object of e, since for each e object a, there is a morphism from some big pj to a, which we can then precompose by little pj. For the next part of the proof, we need to recall that monoid m can be described as a one object category bm, where the single object is denoted by an asterisk, and the homset on this object is defined to be the underlying set of m with composition being defined by the monoid binary operation. We then set I to be the one object category B of the endomorphism monoid of W. And we set D bar to be the obvious diagram from I to E, which sends an I arrow G to the corresponding endomorphism G. Then since E is cone complete, there exists a cone FJ on D bar. But this is just an e-morphism f from w bar to w since i has only one object. We note that for each w endomorphism g, gf is equal to f since f is a cone on d bar. But w is a weak initial object, so there exists some w endomorphism h from w to w bar. Then by our previous observation, we have fhf is equal to f, and therefore fhfh is equal to fh. And we set this equal to e, which shows e is idempotent. Then since E is idempotent complete, E splits as IP via some E object I. And now we claim I is the initial object of E. We first show the endomorphism monoid of I is trivial. For each I endomorphism Q, we have the following commuting diagram, where the green square commutes trivially, and the yellow diagrams on the left and right commute since PI is the identity on I. We note that for each W endomorphism G, GE is equal to E by the blue star above and the definition of E. On the diagram to the left, we have a red commuting triangle with the left side equal to E. Therefore, by the observation on the right, the top diagonal must be E, regardless of what the bottom diagonal, which is a W endomorphism, is. Therefore, Q is equal to PEI by the commutativity of the top quadrilateral, and this is equal to PIPI by substitution of E by its splitting pair IP. And then since pi is the identity on i, this is equal to the identity on i, which shows the monoid of i endomorphisms is trivial. In other words, it only contains the identity on i. 
To show i enjoys the universal mapping property of the initial object, we first know i is a weak initial object, since for each e object a, there is a morphism from w, since it is a weak initial object, and by a precomposition by i, we have a morphism from i to a. So we have left to verify the uniqueness of such a morphism. So let r and r prime be e morphisms with domain i. Then since e is cone complete, this diagram has a cone, which means there exists a morphism S such that RS is equal to R prime S. But I is weak initial, which gives us a morphism T from I to A. Then by composition, we have ST is equal to the identity on I since the I endomorphism monoid is trivial, as we have shown above. So we have R is equal to R precomposed by the identity, which is equal to ST, and this is equal to R prime ST, which again is equal to R prime since ST is the identity. And therefore, I enjoys the universal mapping property of the initial object of E, which completes the proof. So as a corollary, we obtain all the previous adjoint functor theorems as well as the general representability theorem.